Uh, Josh is the executive director and founder of Astra Nova School in Los Angeles, California. The Astra Nova School is a successor of Ad Astra, the school set up uh, with collaboration, uh, in collaboration with Elon Musk at SpaceX. He is the co-founder of Synthesis, a company that brings students together from around the world to learn through complex games. We are so excited to bring you Josh. Let's bring him in. Josh. Hello. How, how are you doing? I'm doing well, quite well. How are you all? Uh, we're good. And do you want to just tell people why you're keeping your voice a bit low? Because it's it's, it's oh, not a sociable hour for you, is it? <laughs> I have a two-year-old and a three-month-year-old that are uh, dozing quietly um, for the moment. So so yeah, um, it's about five yeah five twenty-four a.m. here. But I'm so delighted to be here, and I really appreciate y'all inviting me invited me on. No, like. Seriously, when when I emailed you uh, about a week ago saying, are you sure you don't want to pre-record because it's like half five in the morning over there? Um, I wasn't expecting you to say, yeah, I'll do it. I'll just, I'll do it live. Uh, so thanks for that. And thanks for getting up early. If you've gotten up early, I don't know, you might get up at this time. I, I do get up early, but yeah, no, I've revisited that decision to do it live um, a bit. But no, I'm, I'm happy. it's so much better to do it live. I would uh, I would never be able to watch myself do a couple takes of this. I'd rather just run through it and, uh, and share kind of what's going on with, with my world and uh, and like eager to connect through questions with anyone who, who has any at the end. Fantastic. So should we get started so we can leave we can get some room for questions in? Are you sharing your screen, Josh? I will be sharing my screen. There's video though. I, I don't, I think that that might all work. Is that, is that right? Uh, yeah. So I'm not seeing your screen on here. So if you, if you click, this is going to get very technical now for those watching. Uh, if you click share, oh, oh, it's that? coming up now yet. Um, yeah. And if you, if you, Hopefully we'll we'll be able to hear some sound. Okay, so we'll just yeah. If if not, then uh, then we'll improvise. Okay, cool. Right, we'll jump out and over to you, John. All right, perfect. Well, thank you so much, everyone. So delighted to be here. Uh, I just yeah, I hope to share a little bit of sort of my journey from a you know being a fourth grade teacher to being the head of school at a, a school at SpaceX, and I guess just. Uh, to, to take it back to that moment, I was just sitting at home. It's like a, you know, probably like a Monday night, just getting some work done, closing up, closing up my evening. And I received this email from Elon's executive assistant that said, Elon would like to speak to you about a potential opportunity. Can you be at SpaceX at 6 p.m. on Thursday? And, <laughs> you know, um, I, I didn't I didn't know what to do um, other than to respond immediately. So I just wrote somebody effective like, yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Which um, betrayed the intense curiosity and nervousness that I immediately felt. And also just, you know, to me as a fourth grade teacher at the time, I was teaching one of Elon's kids and it was wondering like, okay, what could this potential opportunity be? And uh, And then of course, all the logistics questions like, where do I park? Do I say that I'm here to meet with Elon Musk for a, a meeting at 6 p.m.? Like all these sorts of things. So I uh, I ended up being late to that meeting, uh, about 15 minutes late. So I didn't know where to park because I pulled into essentially like the rocket bay, like where they're like moving rockets in and out to ship them across the country to, to, uh, to shoot them out of the Cape. And, you know, in that moment, um, I I didn't really know what to do. You know, I'm, I'm at SpaceX. Elon's giving me a tour of the rocket factory. You're trying not to ask silly questions and you're trying to wonder what this opportunity might be. And in the end, this opportunity became a, a school. And it started just as this kind of small project, a project for his kids and a few others. And then it eventually involved, uh, including more kids at SpaceX and around the city of LA. And in terms of direction, I, I had basically these three things. Uh, the first one was there's no budget, but spend money thoughtfully, which is a, a tough thing. Every time you're spending money, whether it's on, I don't know, like new staplers or whatever else, you're just wondering, like, is this like a thoughtful way to spend money? Uh, the second one was only hire world-class talent. So in order for someone to be hired at Ad Astra, they would have to be interviewed by Elon, which made it really difficult sometimes to hire like an elementary school science teacher because Elon essentially has one standard and that standard in his mind is world-class. And if they were not a world-class talent, whatever that means, however he defined it, then they unfortunately were not able to get a job at Ad Astra, which made it really difficult to hire colleagues, um, especially in those early years. 
And then the last one, the one that's really stayed with me is that he just, you know, it's like, you know, I don't really know like what a school should look like. I don't really know what it should be, you know, with AI and the way that things are going, just like make it, just make it great. You know, just he would say that, just make it great. So, you know, those sort of vague, uh, those vague directives were the ones that powered some of those early moments of thinking about like, well, what would the school look like and how should it feel? And what are the questions that we can ask of students? And like, what will my role be in this? Because I'm not an engineer, I'm not a mathematician, I'm not a physicist. In fact, like I'm pretty bad at math. Uh, and the idea was like, how, how am I going to lead this school that's at SpaceX? Am I going to be exposed as this imposter? Because, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, to say that I was world-class was certainly a stretch in my imagination. And uh, it felt like one of those fake it till you make it type things. So we started the school uh, in a conference room at SpaceX. This is uh, the room. It's called the Goddard Conference Room. It's just adjacent to, to the first floor. Elon's office is around the corner. If you turn the corner this way, you, you head into the rocket factory. And the first day of school was 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Day two of school was 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Just knocked two hours right, right at the top, realizing like how difficult it was, even with the nine kids at the time, to keep them engaged in this small room with engineers and other folks at SpaceX walking by all the time, peering through the windows, checking equations on the board. Not that they meant to, just because, you know, when you write the equation for momentum incorrectly, like some engineer, of course, is going to tell you. So we put up these posters just as a way to, to provide some privacy, but also to kind of artifacts of like what we were doing each day. And it was clear that there are gonna be some serious challenges in running a school for nine kids. First of all, it didn't really feel like a school. It felt more like a homeschool situation that just happened to be at a rocket factory. So we started those first six weeks at the campus of SpaceX. We moved for two years to a house, Gene Wilder's old house as it turns out, a very, as you'd imagine, quite quirky house. Uh, near UCLA uh, in LA. And then we moved back to SpaceX campus for years three, four, five, and six. So amidst uh, trying to figure out what Ad Astra was and what the school should be and the importance of it, of course, the media covers it like it was some great epiphany. So this is a few years ago. I, I just typed in Ad Astra School into Google News. And you see things like, uh, welcome to Elon Musk School, where kids play with flamethrowers, which is uh, is not true and was never true. But uh, things like this were, it was interesting to read these things, having, you know, be part of this creative process of the school, being like the creator of the school, and reading things that if you knew were not true, but at the same time, having no real mechanism or desire to sort of correct those stories. So uh, at times it was called the most exclusive school in the world, the secret school at SpaceX, um, this laboratory school, school for brilliant kids, of course, all of whom play with flamethrowers. And, you know, meanwhile, in terms of like the media coverage and really from our standpoint, it was just trying to be as much as possible, just like humble in what we were trying to do, uh, you know, I eagerly invite people to come visit the school, even in its early days, even though there wasn't a whole lot to see, to be honest. Uh, and also to sort of reconcile the fact that we are on campus of like the most innovative company in the world who's sending, you know, now astronauts to space, but at the time Elon's old cars into space and landing the, the, the rockets and sending out Falcon Heavy. And in my mind, it was always, you know, you, yeah, he wanted to create a school that would do justice to the innovation and excellence of the company of SpaceX. And not only was that my job, but that was like something I deeply felt. And when you're on campus and feel that excitement, that energy and that nervousness, uh, it felt like we really needed to create something special. So for me, what that ended up being is like, a, you know, beyond sort of designing the school and the things that we do, it was like, well, what can I create? Like, what's my contribution as an educator to this school? Uh, because it was small. And as I mentioned, it was really hard to hire people. So it was difficult to, to manage a whole lot. I had like two or three colleagues for most, most of that Astra. So what I, what I went back to are kind of like the basics. I mean, Elon's famous for talking about first principles thinking. And for me, it came back to like, why school? Like, what, what is this thing that, that we're doing here? We're gathering these kids together to, I guess, go through a number of exercises and, 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 and experiences, what do they all lead to and what do they beget? And it felt to me like a bunch of shallow 
or even more than shallow experiences divided across different topics and subjects that were all divorced from one another, that these things were unlikely to beget some sort of synthesis that was going to drive, you know, future learning or, or efficacy. So when I think back on my memories, my academic memories, it's weird stuff like my biology teacher dressing up like a mitochondria and, and you know, running around the room. Or um, I guess I remember, you know, specific moments with specific teachers who really made a difference. But by and large, my memories of school were extracurricular or social, you know, it's like sports or just the, you know, kids I liked, the kids I didn't like, you know, the feeling of being in an assembly the feeling of feeling like I had no power, uh, the feeling of failing a test, like those sorts of feelings. So what I was wondering at these, you know, the very inception of Ad Astra was like, what are the types of educational experiences that will endure? And what are these things that, you know, what can I do to create memories that will fire and fuel future endeavors, whatever those may be for whatever the kids that I have the opportunity to work with. And it always felt like if possible, and because again, I, I was fortunate to be able to design this small school and also because I didn't have anything in terms of um, regulations or restrictions or state requirements. I mean, I really just thought, and I think this is of course still true, we all believe this, that it's gonna be much easier if kids love school or learn loving is maybe a better way of saying, or love learning is a better way of saying that. And I thought of like, oh, how can I design something where students are collaborators, which allowed me to sort of reckon with my own ego and own fears, like it's not, I wasn't gonna design like a really creative history course. It's like, okay, I need to create something where my students can be collaborators in the design of this thing that I'm going to build. And I need to come to terms with my own ego in terms of what it means to be a teacher and find ways to connect with the kids over like the shared work that we have together. So in doing that, I think there's just a vulnerability that's implicit uh, in this type of work. And I wanted to just personally kind of model maniacal creativity and like the iterative process. Like if I'm talking about the things that we want students to be, like I kind of need to be that thing, even if it's a sort of prototypical version of that thing or even a lesser version of the thing that I hope for them, I hope that I could model the type of divergent thinking or the type of creativity or the humbleness of work or just vulnerability with sharing something I've designed that I'm hoping will provoke a meaningful educational experience. And the last one is just this expecting course corrections. And I think for so long, I was just fueled by the positive feedback from students or parents around projects that I designed. And I realized that like sort of the best way to approach this was to know that my work is fallible, that of course it's not perfect and there's always opportunity for almost endless improvement and as much as possible to expect those course corrections rather than fear that someone's going to call out how something could be better. And then I think I would be remiss in not mentioning that Elon sort of looms over all of this, not because he was physically present so often at the school, but because, you know, you're wondering like if he walks in, which often, you know, he would from time to time, it's like, would, would he think that this would be something that would be the type of educational experience that would, uh, help fuel like the, you know, people that will be the first to go to Mars, like students that will go on to do like remarkable things. Ideally, some who will go on to work for companies like SpaceX or frankly compete with Elon. So, you know, would, would someone like Elon come in and see these types of activities and think like, ah, like this is, you're on to something here. This feels like what a future focused education should look like. So I didn't know what to call this thing that I was uh, designing in my head. So I called it synthesis because Howard Gardner had talked about the synthesizing mind. I just really liked that idea. So for me, it became this catch all term that really were just experiences designed for reasoning and reflection. So um, it was up to me in my mind to design an experience that would fuel reasoning and reflection. And the things that these synthesis experiences had in common broadly were that they were novel, because I was designing them, you know, in, in Illustrator or Pages or Keynote or whatever I needed to design them. Uh, and they were complex, decision-making focused, uh, competitive and cooperative, and the opportunity for deep reflection. So they really started in two different ways. And the first ones were just more like ethical conundrum based. So like this is an early example of something I call Dinosaur X. Basically, this, this fossil is found the skull of the fossil is on privately held land. The body of the fossil is on public land. The question is like, this is a new discovery. No one's ever seen it before. Uh, what should be done with this new uh, skeleton? Should it be 
uh, kept at the local museum? Should it go to like the national museum? Should it go to a private collector or be part of an international exhibition? Each of these options have different number of visitors per year. And uh, the question was like, basically who gets to decide? Is it the Twain family, the private, the family who owns it on private land, the skull or the government who owns the rest of the skeleton? How would they decide who owns it? And then where do you decide where it ultimately lives? I would create things like this where I was you know, thinking about gender, um, uh, uh, gerrymandering in the United States, which is you'd be able to, to uh, divide up political districts and wondering how I could model a question that students very quickly get into what gerrymandering is and think about how these districts could be drawn in an equitable way. After Trump won the presidency, I was in despair. So I created something where I thought about like, all right, well, if, if Trump has the ability to appoint nine people in his cabinet in terms of experience intelligence and ethics like where is it most essential that uh, one of those cabinet positions embody like the best of those three things and if you had unfortunately if you had to say between like the you know secretary of defense or the treasury secretary the secretary of state or the labor secretary or supreme court justice where are those things maybe less important which is just a, like a quick way to introduce the different positions of the cabinet and then to really think about how important these positions are and where you need highly experienced folk. I mean, ideally you have perfectly uh, ethical, intelligent and experienced folks, but just thinking about that question and presenting it to students um, and then seeing where they felt and then recording that data and then having like a deeper conversation. Um, but really my favorite piece was just asking these one sentence questions. And this one said like, how would you spend $1 trillion in $100 billion increments to create the best possible future, you may not repeat any value. So if you had a, you know, $1 trillion to invest in the best possible future in your mind, and I'm keeping that really broad, if you could in, uh, invest it in advancing art or providing basics or uh, fueling research of the brain, revolutionizing cities, conquering disease, reimagining education, exploring the frontiers of the physical universe, educating leaders or protecting the wilderness, which of these options would you choose? And then how much money would you give to each? Now you could give a trillion to one of the options or you could give, uh, in the original version, you could give $100 billion to eight of them and then maybe give $200 billion to the ninth one. But anyway, we would ask questions like this and then when our parents would come to Ad Astra for open houses or even just kind of routine meetings, we would always gauge like where they felt on this question because it felt as though you know, if you're going to be part of the Ad Astra community, we want you deeply engaged in kind of the big questions. It can't just be that your students are engaged in those big questions and we talk about how engaged they are. We all need to be engaged. So on the x-axis here on the bottom, you can see the amount of money in the $100 billion increments, and you can see age on the y-axis. And if you notice, um, those that gave, let's say, $600 billion or even $500 billion or more, you can see that they are almost all the kids where adults are hedging really hard here, right? $100 billion or $200 billion is where most of their cards are. So anyway, it's just really important in my mind to put all participants in a learning community in these sorts of environments and ask them what they think and have them reason through it and uh, to, to model that constructive disagreement. And then I would write these like more narrative-based questions where there's this lake and there's this company that's polluting and dumping these toxins in the lake. And then there's this puppet master who pays these scientists to publish reports that the lake has never been in better health, even though other scientists have said that the lake is going to be dead in 10 years. And then the media reports that these new scientific claims are equally as valid, or at least reports in a way that seems that they're equally valid to the claims the lake is going to die. The politicians have the power to stop the pollutants, but decide to do nothing. And then the voters who are listening to the media, the politicians and the scientists become deeply divided and confused are not really sure what to do. And they, the polluter continues to, dock, to dump toxic outputs into the lake. 10 years later, the lake dies. The question is who is most to blame? Uh, there is a more positive spin on this called the lake returns. Uh, these are both, um, something called conundrums. So synthesis became these ethical conundrums. And then I partnered with a company called Class Dojo, who has something like 55 million kids that use it every month and found a way to, to create these conundrums and put them into videos so they can be shared. So right now there are 14 conundrums in seasons one and two total, and there'll be an additional 21 conundrums coming out this fall, which is really quite exciting. And I wanted to just share one with you. It's based on the dinosaur conundrum, the one I shared with you originally, and uh, just kind of give you a sense of what these look like. Conundrums. 
created by Astronova School. Number eight, the dinosaur conundrum. All right, I've got a question for you. Imagine this. A team of fossil hunters makes the discovery of a lifetime in a sand dune far from any city or town. They find the biggest, baddest, most perfectly intact dinosaur skeleton. They named this new species Dinosaur X. So what should they do with the valuable skeleton? Option A, local museum. Create a museum for Dinosaur X close to where it was discovered. This will bring more people who are eager to see Dinosaur X to this part of the world, and visitors will have the chance to look for the next great discovery. Option B, research center. Send the skeleton to the world's leading research center. Experts will study Dinosaur X in great detail and learn everything about its life. Unfortunately, no visitors will be able to see it. Option C, Dino Universe. Send the skeleton thousands of miles away to the world's largest dinosaur amusement park that attracts millions of visitors each year. Option D, Private Collector. Sell the skeleton to a wealthy private collector and use that money to make copies of the bones to be shared for free with any museum that wants to display them. So what should happen to Dinosaur X? Are you Team Local Museum? Team Research Center? Team Dino Universe? Or a team private collector? All right, so that's an example of a conundrum. There are 14 of those, of course. They're on our YouTube channel. They're um, also on Class Dojo. And the idea, of course, is that you can watch the video, get a sense of a good question, it's accessible, it's welcoming, and then like-minded people can disagree. All sorts of people have the opportunity to disagree and discuss like which of these options is best for the skeleton. So another piece, and to kind of wrap up here, <clears throat> that I started working on with this thing called synthesis, I started designing games. Because it felt like if I could design a game, you're having to make some tough decisions. It's novel, it's complex. And it's a great way to engage. In this case, these are like two, two people games. Um, then I started building like larger games that could be played with more people. And uh, what was really cool about building games is like students that would always have a creative outlet within the game. So this was a game of space exploration called Afar. And student, I wasn't explicitly teaching Fusion 360, but part of the project was to model like what spaceship that you would use to travel among these planets, which is just kind of a creative outlet. And I was always amazed at like the types of things students would do to take this game that I would design and then take these moments uh, where you have the opportunity for creativity and do something really remarkable. And of course, that arms race where kids would see someone using Fusion 360, like, I want to create something like that. And they would like learn, download the program, learn how to use it, and then model something really fantastic. And then in every game that I design, there's an opportunity for students to make the game better. So this is a student design of the same game. So this is my version. These different planets that you could travel to with different um, point values. And then the student designs something that I find it to be a whole lot better. Um, and then finally, in terms of synthesis, I started doing um, games that were more collaborative and competitive, or there are more teams involved. Really early on at Ad Astra, I created a game called World's End, which was you know this idea that there are these different works of art that would be for sale, and you have to win them in auctions. And I was fortunate enough, the engineer that I worked on with the conundrums uh, at Class Dojo left the company about a year ago and asked if I would be interested in starting a company based around synthesis. So I said no like five times. And I was like, I have no time for this. And if, even if I did, I'm not, I don't fancy myself to be a tech entrepreneur in any real way. But he persisted and we did a couple of tests. And in the end, we ended up creating a company called Synthesis, which brings Synthesis um, to any kid in the world, of course, who has an internet connection. It is a tech startup, so it's still like very early. And there are, of course, all sorts of, of challenges getting it to scale. But the idea is taking these types of experiences, these games, and building them in ways where they can um, be used through software. So teams around the world can come together to play these types of games. So this is a game called Art for All, which is based on an early game called World's End that I created at Astra, and it looks like this. Call me Matthew. Sorry, my light is horrible. <laughs> 
Should we travel now? Let's travel to Tokyo. I'm pretty sure that most people will be going to Tokyo. Why yeah. don't we go to somewhere where no one's going? Yeah, well, reverse psychology. If you guys don't mind, I've nominated surreal portraits. Oh, I found an abstract head. It's so good at your time. I like the shrine game. Okay, yeah, you do that one. How much do we make until we stop? Is it 27 too much? How about 20 million for the ruler of Kai? 25? No, no, no! No, Vlad is getting it. Oh, we, we got one. We got one. Yes. yes. We got it for 16,000. Let's go. We're first place. Oh, nice. No. Yeah, she did extremely well on that one. Let's up the price. Let's dial it down to 41. Let's go. Oh, no one else wants to Cape Town. Want to go Cape Town now? Tokyo's empty. Curate! I never saw that before. Let's review the situation. We have to make it look like it tells a story. Uh, let's just experiment. We'll see what happens. Do you guys like this game? I like this game. Yeah. yeah. Welcome back, everyone. Are you going to play the game with right now? Um, all right, so that is the game called Art for All and Synthesis. So right now, uh, Synthesis has about six games, and they're you know these novel experiences that are designed with engineers. The idea is whether it's in art or you're um, choosing you know traveling between stars or working to put out fires. They're these like novel experiences. They're complex. They're engaging. And rather than tell students the rules of the game, we just have them figure it out. So you get past that point of of struggle where. You don't know how to move and you're frustrated by that, but then you figure it out. And then suddenly, you know, in a small group, you start to bootstrap your way into like a deeper understanding of how the game works and eventually beyond the mechanics into actual strategy. And of course, this creates great opportunities for reflection. So to kind of conclude here, um, axioms of synthesis are embrace the chaos, test your assumptions, expect course corrections. When I design games, I'm trying to um, create a game that's really welcoming to the novice player. It's deep and that you can feel that depth. It allows you to make consequential decisions. You provide opportunities for all players. It's built for openness, so allowing for new configurations. It has fast and slow elements. It allows for mass cooperative goals. It has compelling context or narrative, in this case, um, art. And then students will be continue playing the game after their four or eight cohort sessions. Like They're hopefully games that stay with you, the ones you want to come back to. And you'll have these really impactful moments that you can draw from as you play additional synthesis games, but really like make connections and live your life. Um, as always, a synthesis student should be challenged, have the opportunity to make friends, feel like they're part of something special, be empowered to speak, to create, to shape the experience, to shape the company, feel like they're accomplishing something worthwhile, feel progress, and then see the evolution in, in what we design. So really kind of to put this all together, I was given this once in a lifetime opportunity and I was granted like just tremendous fortune uh, to be in a position to design a school at SpaceX. And what I you know, came to, um, and, and it was the expectation that when people come to Ad Astra, they want to see something special paired with like my deep conviction that I like, I feel like I could create something special. And even if I wasn't there yet, it felt like over the years of trial and error and just being vulnerable enough to share a work I've created with students. And uh, of course, being open and receptive to their ideas, because far often they were far better than my ideas to to take that work and to build it into this thing that's now if not cohesive at least can embody something that is synthesis and in my mind the goal of of both the company and astronova the school and at astra the school and conundrums themselves is just to get better learning experiences into the hands of kids that we can create academic memories um, moments where they can engage with others in their classroom engage with other people in different schools from around the world and like work on problems that are engaging and less instructions and less pre-work and less diagnostics and less sort of front-loading all of this information and more just like getting right into the real stuff right away. Because I really do think the kids crave complexity and I think they also crave voice and they crave power and just give them an opportunity to, to do something that's new and different. And even if it's imperfect, I feel like it can have a really powerful effect. So um, thank you again for having me here. I'm happy to answer any questions. I, I try to give you a 25 minute overview of a lot of the work that I've been doing, um, but I'm, I'm eager to hear if there are any questions and I'm happy to spend as much time answering them as there's time for. I think I'm a bit, a bit over. Thanks, Josh. No, um, yep. yeah, it was fantastic. And I'm kind of sat here wishing we'd give you a bit more time now. Um, but let's let's jump, in, let's jump into a few questions. So we've got one from uh, from... Orange Robert there, who says, from your experience, what are the best ways to determine student progress when designing such a creative collaborative learning process? The difference between that first moment and uh, in a subsequent moment. So when you start a synthesis game, 
the most common things you hear are, this is impossible. This makes no sense. It's broken. <laughs> um, legit, you, I mean, this is, there's a lot of whining basically, <laughs> which I love, right? Because the natural tendency you have is to want to step in and say, oh, here, like just it's this button or like, oh, like a Dutch auction is when it counts down from 100 billion, $100 million. You should try to get the lowest price. But if you wait too long, someone else will grab it before you. But the best thing to do is to wait. And then to watch that evolution over that session and then over multiple sessions to the point where <laughs> they're thinking, you know, at a high level, like game theory, essentially. Um, but the best thing to do is just to create the conditions such that they can figure it out and not intervene. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, we've got another one for you from Nick uh, Dearden, who said, I love the call to model uh, maniacal, maniacal, am I saying that right? Creativity. Right. Any tips yeah. on encouraging the less uh, maniacal, maniacal, I'm, I'm struggling today, or less creative to join in? Yeah. So I think with conundrums, what's really nice is when you just like ask like, okay, so let's say in the dinosaur conundrum as an example, like let's say the dino universe was your, like of the options, like that's the worst option. What I would say to encourage that maniacal creativity would be to say, all right, what conditions would have to exist such that that could be your best option, the option that you would actually say is the one that should happen. And the same is true of like the private collector. You might be totally against the idea that a private collector could own it, even if they're gonna make copies of that skeleton, but then ask like, okay, well, what would need to change in order for that to be a more desirable option for you? So I think so much, it's not that you have to be doing this kind of zero to one creativity, but just tinkering always with options and thinking about the different shades of gray and bringing those into play as much as possible because there must be conditions in which Dino Universe would be, you know, the top option, especially if you said it should be like the local museum or something like that. So that, that's what I would recommend is uh, is the tweaking. And then you start to enough tweaking. It's like this new thing that you've created. Yeah. And we've got we've got one more. Um, yeah. Uh, just to fit in with the time here, we, uh, what would Elon do? This is from Andy Lewis. Great question. <laughs> what are your key uh, learns on creating and empowering great cultural foundations? G great cultural foundations? Yeah. Um, I think like not hedging was the is the big one. You know, I feel, so if you look to the, the responses to that moonshot question, right? Everyone's, all the, all the adults are giving hundred billion to all these causes. And I think there's just some audacity to saying like, no, like what's the thing that you really care about? Like what, what can you contribute to it? And what will it take to get there? And how can we support you? So I think just living a little bit with some, some audacity and having that as part of like the culture of the school, knowing that there are people that identify in a number of different ways and I love different challenges, but to be magnetized by complexity and find the thing that you're like most driven to do and, and like let us support you in that. But you're probably not gonna be able to do it all. You know, Elon's a good example of that, even though he tries. Um, so as much as possible, find the thing that you love and, uh, and let us figure out what we can do to support you in it. Amazing. Um, yeah. Like we said at the start, we at four o'clock today, uh, we will be releasing our in-depth interview with Josh. So it is an hour-long interview, uh, the four of us chatting, um, getting um, getting a bit more in-depth into it. Um, uh, so that will be released at four o'clock on YouTube as a video and on our podcast 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 channel um, for everyone. Have you to, been drinking, Dan? Is it because you left it? He's half cut. Yeah. Definitely half cut. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, so Josh, thank you. Thanks very much for for coming on at half five in the morning and of and, and delivering a knockout uh, keynote. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Um, oh, I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. See you, everyone. Take care. See ya. Bye -bye. See you. Later,